Hello and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I have sitting beside me my business partner and good friend, the incredible celebrity chef Del Shrove. Hi everybody. Okay, so I didn't bring Del onto today's uh, program to talk about food. That's kind of unusual. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do some role playing to give you some ideas about how to have conversations with your doctor. And where this came from is Dell teaches a class here called Informed Health 201, which teaches people um, how to uh, look at medical research, make better decisions, um, how to look at claims made by other people about diets and all this sort of thing. And uh, somebody in the class said, you know, this is all great and I can see where I need to change some things and I wish I knew how to handle my doctor. And I hear people saying that all the time, like what am I supposed to say and all that. So we thought we would give you some various scenarios. and. Um, Sometimes Del will play the doctor, and sometimes I'll play the doctor, and we had to script this out because neither of us would say any of the things that the doctor is going to say in these particular situations, and particularly for Del, because Del's such a nice person. He's always nice to everybody. He would never get snippy with somebody. <laughs> so we had to write it down <laughs> for Del to come up with I have to snippy. practice snippy. Yeah. So the first one is I'm going to play the patient, and... Um, uh, I'm going to be a type 2 diabetic who wants to uh, stop taking meds, and uh, Dell's going to play doctor, so you go. I'm ready. Good morning. How are you? Well, good. I'd like to talk to you about something. I've been really concerned about my health lately. I mean, you know what's been going on. I've been gaining weight and taking drugs, and I've been doing a little research. I found out that some people like me who are type 2 diabetics can often reverse their diets, their diabetes by changing their diets. And so since I've last seen you, it's been a while, I, I've adopted this plant-based diet and um, I've lost a few pounds. I don't know if you can see it, but you'll see it on the scale. And I'd like to talk about reducing and eventually eliminating my medication. Oh, wait, where exactly did you get this information? Well, I watched a movie called Food Choices and it has had some patients who actually did get better with not just diabetes, other stuff too. And uh, one guy even reversed his cancer. So I contacted one of the experts in the film and I talked to her. Wait, 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 wait. So you're telling me you got this from a movie and who is this person you're talking to? Well, she's a nutritionist and a naturopath and she's the one who showed me how to do this diet so I would do it right. All right, so she, she's not a medical doctor and, and that's a problem. Um, Non-medical people do not understand that diseases like diabetes are chronic and they don't go away. I just don't want to see you get disappointed. You're not going to reverse your diabetes no matter what you eat. Well, I'm going to try it. I mean, I'm already trying it. If I'm right and she's right, my markers are going to improve and then I'm going to need less medication. Uh, I'm not going to let you hurt yourself by taking less medication. Well, I really feel strongly about this and I'm going to do it. So, and I'd like your help because I don't feel comfortable doing this on my own. So let me ask you this. Can we just take it a step at a time? I'll come in every few weeks or 60 days or whatever you tell me and we'll look at my weight, we'll look at my A1C, and then we can decide together what to do. Because I really do value your advice and I don't want to do this on my own. If I get better, will you reduce my medication? We'll talk. Okay. All right. So in this particular scenario, the doctor doesn't really believe that diet makes a difference. That's pretty common. Um, the patient holds her ground. This is something I've decided to do finds a way to negotiate with the doctor. Um, you know, you might want to think about leaving a doctor who's not very nice like this, but the point is that um, you can negotiate a settlement. In other words, the, the goal of the appointment isn't to get the doctor to get on board with the diet or to understand the diet or to make him a plant-based doctor. The goal of this is to simply be able to negotiate with this person so you can get what you want. And sometimes it means look, you know, saying, um, we'll see what the results are. One thing I want to say too, and I'll say it in defense of, you know, you, <laughs> is that um, doctors usually don't see people get better. And so if you've been in practice for 25 years, like this particular doctor may have been, and people come in and they go, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to improve my diet, I'm going to get off my drugs, and they've, they've heard that before. I don't want to take my drugs, and people just stop taking their drugs. So I do give doctors the benefit of the doubt a little bit because um, they don't really see people get better. So you could be the first person who does it and really uh, teach your doctor something through uh, demonstration. Okay? All right, so let's do the next one. Um, and I'm the doctor, and we're going to talk about PSA testing. Well, good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, 
I know we've had this discussion before, and I'm going to bring it up again. You really do need to have a PSA test. Putting it off is not only not helpful, but it puts your health at risk. And I've told you this before. I, I'm not putting it off. I'm refusing. Well, tell me again why you're saying no. Well, PSA is, is not a marker for cancer, and the test is unreliable. Well, who told you that? I, I read a book by the researcher who discovered PSA, and he says it's not and never has been a marker for cancer. Well, listen, I'm, I'm going to set the record straight here. Early detection saves lives, and PSA is the best early detection test we have for prostate cancer, and that's why I keep harping on it. But, it's not a marker for cancer, so there's no benefit. I can lend you a copy of my book if you'd like to read it. I really don't read books. I'm too busy, and I really focus on medical journals. Well, well there are several journal articles in the book. Well, I think we'll just leave it right now as that you refuse, and I'll bring it up again next year. And I'm going to make a note in your records that I continue to talk to you about this, and you refuse to do it. So be it. Okay. So, once again, refusing, standing your ground, etc. All right. I'm going to be the doctor again, I think, on this one. Which one are we doing? Um, scenario two. Oh, no, you're the doctor. And, um, you want me to have a mammogram. Scenario I two. I do want you to have a mammogram. Okay. Okay. All right, I see here that you are 60 years old and have never had a mammogram. I think we need to schedule one right away. Well, I made up my mind several years ago not to have one because the risk that I'll be harmed is three times greater than the chance I'll benefit. That's not true. Mammograms save lives, and on this issue, I think I'm going to have to insist. You're long past due. I've looked into this a lot, and I'd like to share some of the articles that I've read on this topic so that we could discuss them. I, I don't need to see this. I've read about this in reliable science to show that mammograms save lives. Well, I'd like to see the articles that you've read, and then I would be able to make a better decision, perhaps. I don't have time to do that. This is a busy practice. Well, if you don't have any supporting evidence, then I'm going to go with the evidence I have, and it shows no benefit for somebody like me. I suppose it's up to you, but it's bad medicine, and I'm going to note in your file that you're not following medical advice. Okay, but I just don't feel comfortable doing this. Okay, so once again, the PSA and the mammogram, very common because they're considered standard practice. And um, in both cases, the patients held their ground and just said, I don't want to do this. And I know that that's very uncomfortable for people uh, to hold their ground on this type of thing. But um, if you're really convicted about it, you can just say no. I mean, they're not going to kidnap you and tie you up until you um, put you in t some type of torture chamber until you say yes. So you really do have the right to say no. Okay. Um, let's do the one on cancer diagnosis, because I think that's a, a really good one and um, one that people deal with all the time. Okay. So I'm, I'm the doctor in this situation and Del's the patient. All right, Del, I know that this is a very stressful situation, but I also want you to know we are going to do everything we can to help you through this. You're going to have the very best medicine and medical care in the world. Well, well that makes me feel better. Now, your cancer is aggressive, so aggressive treatment is going to be needed. So I'm proposing both radiation and chemotherapy after your surgery. Okay, so um, how will this help me? Well, the surgery is going to take out the tumor, and that's the first step. We have to get this taken out. And then the follow-up therapy will kill any remaining cancer, center, uh, uh, cancer cells that remain, either near the tumor or throughout your body. Well, how do we know that there are remaining cancer cells? Well, there always are. We really can't see them. We just know that they're likely there. And this is, I just want you to know, it's the gold standard treatment. It's what we do in this medical center. Okay, so what's the success rate? Well, patients who do what we say have 50% longer lives than those who don't get this particular treatment. And 50% is a lot. Okay, so 50% of what? In other words, are we talking about people who don't do this treatment living for 30 years and those who do living for 45? Um, well, not quite. Let's just say that you have an aggressive cancer and the best chance for a longer life is to do this. I need to know more about how long and also about the side effects. And, and the best way for me and my cancer team to see this is in research study form so we can take a look at the effects. Tell me, now wait a minute, what, what is this cancer team thing? Well, it, it's a group I put together to help me navigate this because I, I'm too stressed to think clearly on my own. Well, Del, that's why you have me. I'll provide the direction and you can just relax and focus on getting well. I want to get well, but I'm one of those funny people that needs to see things in writing in order to feel good and confident about what I'm doing. Well, published studies, if you're looking at things in writing, do show that this treatment works. And remember, these are in writing. Okay, can you, can you give them to me? 
Well, I'll see if I can get a staff member to get these. In the meantime, we need to schedule surgery, and then we need dates for your first follow-up treatment. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead with the surgery, but I'm not committing to the follow-up treatments until I've had a chance to evaluate the published evidence. I'll see what I can do. Okay, now some comments about this. Cancer is one of the most stressful situations, and people have a tendency to just want to turn their lives over to somebody who seems like they know what they're doing, and, uh, or a team who know what they're doing, and say, please fix me because I'm terrified and I want to live. And in this case, Dell holds his ground. I want to see information. And when the doctor brings up 50% increased survival, 50% of what? If people live for six weeks without treatment and 12 weeks with treatment, most people aren't looking for 12 weeks of survival. They'd like to, I mean, I'm 60, I want to live to be 100, so I'd be looking for 40 years, right? So Dell's insisting that he got information in writing, and that's a continuing theme throughout these scenarios that we're giving you. And he's also, because he's an educated consumer, he's saying 50% of what? What are we talking about here? People live for 30 years versus 45, or is it weeks, or whatever. And notice how deftly the doctor, and this happens all the time, is able to evade the question and kind of try to move on to something else without being specific because she knows that this is not what Dell wants to hear. And by the way, what, one of the things, and again, I try to give doctors the benefit of the doubt, we had a member here with cancer who was pressing a doctor in this way. And here's what the doctor said, and I'm sure it's well-intentioned, but it gives you some insight as to the thinking process. He said, um, we just don't want our cancer patients to be worried about things like this. And, and this patient replied, I have stage four cancer. I'm pretty worried already, so I think that we don't worry about not worrying me right now. You've got to worry about giving me data to make a good decision. So um, just a few things that I'll point out in summarizing everything here. We could play role play these all, the, all day long, and, and I think you get the idea. The first thing is that, that you're not trying to talk a doctor into agreeing with you. Sometimes they do. Most of the time, they don't. You're just trying to protect yourself against unnecessary testing and treatment and ask questions. Notice that in all cases that we showed you, we showed you four scenarios, the patient is really convicted about this. And the reason is because in both cases, I mean, we would both behave this way and with a doctor because we have taken the time to understand this stuff me because of my training, Dell because he's very interested. You're, you probably know as much about a lot of these things as I do um, at this point in time. So Dell would have no trouble standing up to a very aggressive doctor about PSA testing, not because he's just an aggressive person, but because he knows he's seen all of this information and he knows PSA testing is not a good idea for him. Okay, so um, this is why it's important to become an informed consumer. Um, notice that the patients offer evidence, they're in possession of evidence, and they are willing to receive and look at evidence because that's what this is really all about. It's not what do I think, what do you think, I think PSA testing is a good idea, you think it's not. It, this should always be an evidence-based discussion, discussion, not a I think, he thinks, she thinks, somebody else thinks. That, that is no way to make an important medical decision. It's always up to you. You do not need to be frightened. These people can't do anything to you if you say no. They can be aggravated with you, and there's a part of us, all of us, that would like to get along with people and seek approval from people and doctors or people in authority, and I understand that, but in all cases, the decision ultimately has to be up to you. You can practice doing this on your own before you go in to see doctors. Anytime you're going to do something unfamiliar, whether it's having a conversation with a physician or giving a presentation to a group, always a good idea to practice out loud. If the doctor does provide you with information, make sure you sit down and talk to somebody who understands this type of thing if you haven't yet been through this training so you can really see what it means. Um, don't be intimidated by medical information. Anybody can learn how to do that. That's what we teach people here how to do. That's what one of the things our members learn how to do. Anybody can learn to evaluate evidence, and anybody can advocate for himself or herself. And um, one last thing I'll say is that you know, Dell comes from Dell and I both come from traditional families where doctors are revered. We've both had family members pressure us to do all kinds of things. I've gotten my share of practice from family members doing just that. Yeah, and so sometimes these same types of discussions can carry over to family members. I've seen evidence that says this. If you have some evidence you want me to look at, that's fine. But having an argument based on what you think is just not, we're not going to let the conversation degenerate into that situation. 
So thank you so much. I hope that this has been helpful and it's given you some ideas about how to talk to your doctor. A lot of people think they've got to go find a, um, a particular doctor who's already on board with all this stuff. And, and there are some out there, but not many and not enough. So you may have to just find yourself negotiating with your own doctor. And hopefully these, um, this role playing will help. Thank you, Dal. Thank you.